on va commencer. Euh, vous m'entendez, c'est bon, là Avec le quart d'heure que nous avons d'habitude. d'habitude. Donc, bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Donc, good evening. Parce que ce soir, nous allons effectivement avoir une soirée mixte entre English et French. Parce que notre speaker qui est là, Father, il va nous, aider, donc, il nous attend. Donc, on va commencer d'abord. Donc, à mes côtés, ce soir, il y a Christina. Bonsoir. Qui va faire une grande partie de la partie en English pour vous. Et donc, on va commencer rapidement. Donc déjà, bienvenue à tous ceux qui sont des héros. Hein, comme vous savez, ici chez nous, vous êtes des héros, même si c'est pour, pour cette soirée. <rire> Et on va parler effectivement de euh, plusieurs langues. Mais bon, on parlera l'anglais. Donc, Christina, à toi de nous expliquer un petit peu comment fonctionne le groupe maintenant. <rire> Uh, basically, we have four types of events in our group, in terms of data science. We have uh, conferences, like the one you are attending tonight. We have uh, data no blah blah, which are actually uh, workshops, some of the hands on workshops. We have data mojito, which is the science part. <laughs> and we have also recently added the data kaga competition, which are basically data science competitions. We will have a little bit more detail afterwards or during the, this presentation. Ok, donc on a commencé depuis la dernière fois euh, avec une séance un petit peu des de news. Donc on a sélectionné pour vous des faits marquants dans le domaine des data science ou machine learning. Euh, et puis aujourd'hui c'est moi qui ai fait la, la sélection. Et donc j'ai sélectionné euh, ces projets que j'ai trouvé très intéressants. En fait c'est Microsoft qui lance un prototype euh, pour les personnes euh, avec des sciences visuelles qui permet donc de équipé des, des lunettes, euh, de prendre une photo euh, de son environnement et de le décrire, hein, qu'est-ce qui est en train de se passer. Parce que j'imagine que vous avez suivi euh, Facebook, Google et tous les autres acteurs de, donc, de web investissent massivement dans le machine learning, notamment pour la reconnaissance d'images. Et ce qui est intéressant, c'est que quand ces algorithmes sont assez donc, euh, précis, on peut euh, faire des produits, donc en tout cas des choses qui peuvent transformer la vie des personnes plutôt qu'à euh, détecter des choses pour augmenter, euh, on va dire, le, les ventes, le poignet moyen de des certains <rire> des commerçants, on peut utiliser des choses à des fins un peu plus, on va dire, euh, fun, en tout cas, qui aident la vie des gens. Donc, vous voyez, donc, la personne qui, est, qui, qui ne peut pas voir, elle a pu savoir si elle en face des personnes, si c'est une femme, un homme, c'est son état d'esprit, euh, grâce à justement des, des, des algos qui vont pouvoir décrire avec une certaine précision. Donc dans certains cas, fonctionne très bien. Je ne sais pas si vous avez déjà vu comment il fonctionne. Donc il est capable de décrire voilà, une personne qui, qui joue de frisbee dans un parc euh, avec plusieurs autres personnes autour et un chien qui passe. C'est assez précis. Et la chose devient encore plus sympa quand il va au restaurant. Donc il, il regarde et donc l'algo est capable donc, de faire un passing. Euh, faire une connaissance de, une reconnaissance des de caractères, donc rien là, rien d'étonnant, mais de pouvoir interpréter dans le contexte. Par exemple, lisez-moi juste les entêtes, parce qu'il ne va pas lire tout le menu d'un coup, donc à la personne peut lire, pour lire, par exemple, les entrées, les, les plats et les desserts. Donc c'est un projet qui est assez intéressant et qui montre comment le machine learning euh, peut vraiment avoir un impact sur notre quotidien. Il s'arrive euh, très rapidement. Qu'est-ce qu'il nous a dit un autre euh, Nous avons des meet-up à venir, donc là c'est un peu coupé, mais je vais vous décrire. Donc ce soir, avec Pader qui est là, qui va nous expliquer euh, tout l'écosystème data de Python. Donc si vous êtes là, c'est parce que vous connaissez, j'imagine, Python. Hein je vois qu'il y en a là, qui sont des geeks, qui ont déjà mis le t-shirt d'occasion. Euh, et vous utilisez, j'imagine, quand vous faites de la data science, essentiellement Python R. Donc ce soir, on va parler énormément de produits data R. Et après, nous allons faire une série de ce qu'on appelle « Data Science dans le Cloud euh, », les produits qui ont été développés donc, par Amazon ML, Amazon, donc Amazon ML, pour faire du machine learning. Et euh, après, bien évidemment, pour pouvoir euh, s'y donner d'autres visions, d'autres produits, euh, Azure, Azure ML, peut-être que vous, euh, vous connaissez déjà, je sais qu'ici, il y a des gens qui nous font, il y a eu Stéphane, donc euh, il est là, donc il est organisateur donc, de... Euh, de Toulouse Azure, c'est ça Donc euh, tout ce qui est Microsoft, et donc il sera avec nous pour cette occasion, pour cette euh, soirée, pour faire aussi un léger et léger retour d'expérience avec les, les, les produits Azure. Pardon. 
Et le plus euh, récemment, donc la semaine dernière, ça, si je ne pas, la semaine dernière nous avons lancé euh, les concours, de, les compétitions Data Science. Donc vous, vous peut-être vous avez entendu parler de Kaggle, ou data, data Science.net. Donc ce sont des plateformes qui permettent à des data scientists de, de, de faire de la compétition avec les compétences qui sont les, les, les larmes et de mettre machine learning. Donc nous avons créé une équipe et pour ça, pour faire un petit retour rapidement de ce qui s'est passé et qu'est-ce qui va ce qui va venir. Donc Alexia, co-organisatrice aussi de TDS et euh, Florent. Donc euh, si tu si vous voulez bien venir à nous expliquer rapidement qu'est-ce qui va se passer. Bonsoir à tous. Donc brièvement quelques mots. Euh, mercredi dernier, on a créé, donc on a introduit et débuté ce nouvel événement, événement du TDS des Data Kegel, et euh, qui consistait à, donc qui consiste à euh, créer des équipes et participer à des compétitions de Data Science, notamment sur Kegel. Mercredi dernier, il y a quand même une trentaine de personnes intéressées qui sont venues, et donc nous avons introduit ce qui est Kegel. Donc euh, ceux qui ne connaissent pas, en quelques mots, c'est un site internet qui organise des compétitions. Euh, qui sont euh, issus de sujets proposés par une entreprise, donc euh, du monde de l'industrie. Donc euh, très intéressant pour se euh, forger une espérance et s'entraîner un peu sur des cas concrets de, de business case. Donc nous avons présenté Kaggle, les règles associées à ces compétitions, et puis nous avons eu l'occasion de faire un retour d'expérience sur euh, les compétitions que, que nous avons pu faire, euh, Rénald, euh, Frédéric, Alexia et moi, euh, donc euh, des compétitions proposées par exemple par Airbnb, Telstra en Australie, en réseau télécom. Euh, il y a aussi des compétitions d'entraînement qui sont disponibles sur la plateforme, puisqu'il n'y a pas que des compétitions proposées par les entreprises, il y a aussi des sujets sur lesquels vous pouvez venir vous entraîner tranquillement, euh, comme prédire euh, la, la probabilité que quelqu'un survive au naufrage du Titanic. Des ouais. choses euh, assez sympa à faire. Et donc euh, prochainement, on va organiser des ateliers qui, sont, euh, qui vont introduire un peu... Euh, euh, les gens qui sont intéressés à Kaggle, euh, avec les, la démarche en compétition, hein, quelles sont les, les étapes à franchir pour participer. Et, euh, et puis ensuite, euh, surtout, créer des équipes pour participer à des compétitions en cours et donc monter euh, en compétences, euh, profiter de cette expérience pour partager entre data scientists sur ces sujets. Donc, je pense que tu as tout dit à peu près. Euh, si vous voulez nous rejoindre, vous pouvez vous inscrire à la mailing list parce qu'on va on communique essentiellement. Euh par la mailing list pour ne pas spammer les 700 personnes du, du meet-up. Donc vous avez toute la procédure écrite ici. Euh, sinon, euh, on la mettra dans les commentaires euh, du meet-up. Voilà. Bon, merci à Alexia, merci à Plon. Euh, donc, qu'est-ce que nous avions donc Ok, donc bien évidemment. Euh, cette salle euh, qui vous, donc, nous sommes, elle est super. Vous avez pu apprécier. Donc, euh, grâce à Toulouse Business School qui nous, nous, nous accueille aimablement dans leurs locaux, euh, qui nous offre cette place pour voilà, faire un meet-up euh, sympa. Et bien évidemment, au live, mais ça, je vais laisser Christina après, elle a une surprise pour vous. Hein. Et puis, euh, nous avons bien évidemment nos sponsors, hein, et nous, comme d'habitude, nos fidèles, notre fidèle sponsor Dexter, donc qui euh, a Renouvelé pour une saison encore, donc non, ils sont pas encore, les saisons ne sont pas finies, donc je crois qu'il y a une slide. Voilà, donc il, est, il nous soutient encore pour la saison 2016, donc 2017. Donc comme vous savez, c'est très important pour nous d'avoir le soutien des sponsors, non seulement parce qu'ils sont là, donc c'est toutes ces ce, ce quatre, quatre, trois personnes qui sont là. Et, et puis bien évidemment, vous savez, après ça nous permet aussi de passer un bon moment autour d'une pizza et d'une bière. Donc, bien évidemment, aussi SQLI qui nous a rejoint depuis peu, depuis le dernier meet-up. Donc, euh, il y a trois personnes d'SQLI ici, donc Flora même. Il y a Claudie qui est se cache au fond, non C'est bon Et Stéphanie. <rire> donc, merci à vous. Ah, il y a là aussi qui est là, donc oui, ça, ça grossit, hein on, on, on s'habitue. <rire> Et donc, I think it's time to speak in English again, because I think um, Christina has some uh, a gift for you. For you. Not necessarily, you have to work. Vous 
I, I hope you don't have uh, the hot hand. It's okay. Yeah. The hand. It's fine for you. Okay. Hey, maybe do you know do you know Strat function? Maybe you have been there. In past? I know. I've no. been this. Oh, I have actually. Yeah, I've been this company. Okay. So um, it's it's a very um, business book. Yeah, it's a very business uh, focused at uh, um, conference. It's important to know as well how data is uh, change your business. So it's going to be in London, and uh, besides we will draw also a backup in case uh, the winner can go. Just in case. Hopefully, we will not kill the. By computer, computer things, you know, I have, a, have a, always a backup, you know, never know. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks again to our sponsors for this, uh, for this opportunity. Yeah. A special thanks to you as well, to, to be here. Nothing yet. Huh? And uh, our speaker tonight, it's Fada. Oh, it's me. Okay. Yes, <laughs> it's you, exactly. Uh, he's a senior data scientist in Channel 4. He has extensive uh, experience in machine learning and statistical algorithms. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And uh, tonight, uh, tonight he will um, share with us his knowledge about uh, Pi Data ecosystem. Right. Uh, and, and just to prepare uh, to prepare. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, eventually. Huh. Thanks, and uh, please welcome uh, Father Akwai. second slide is how to pronounce my name because I've been giving so many conferences over, around Europe over the past couple of years that it's just getting a bit annoying and I wish I was given a name like Paul or something <laughs> that was a bit more accessible. So uh, I'm a senior data scientist at Channel 4. For those of you who do not know what Channel 4 is, Channel 4 is a London, primarily London based television channel. It's a not-for-profit um, it's, it's generally regarded uh, highly for progressive views and like, tackles like social issues and stuff. Um, the, the most equivalent in France is Canal Plus, so it gives you an idea of what sort of subject matter is, 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 is copied, is, is handled by this organisation. And there I'm a senior data scientist. Um, I just joined two weeks ago, so I haven't done any work yet. I've been giving conferences. Um, and, uh, and I'll be working on recommendation engines and customer segmentation. So um, the, the talk was titled uh, for advertising as introduction to Pi Data, but I call this more the map of the Pi of the stack. And it's uh, an exploration of the current uh, Pi Data ecosystem. It's very similar to a talk I gave in Amsterdam, but um, at the Pi Data uh, conference there, um, which is an awesome, awesome conference. I recommend it for everyone to go to, or any of the Pi Data. Like there's one in Paris this year, I believe. Um, if I'm speaking too fast, shout at me. If you have any questions, please shout out. I welcome challenges, you know, questions, everything like this. You know, it's really, um, I also find this helps me understand this stuff better. Because what you'll discover as I talk through this ecosystem is it's actually got quite complicated. Um, you know, like, when do we use Spark? Why should we use Spark? All these sort of things. And we all kind of become, like, religious about this. So my aim is to try to give, uh, I'd try to first thing not lose my, uh, 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 which is mostly to do with monitors or printers and all these sort of things. Okay, so so that's a bit of introduction. Um, so it's the, the map of the stack. And this here is the one I warned you about. Um, uh, if you go to GitHub, my, my earliest is Spring Coil. This is what I'm also known as on Twitter. 
um, you'll find lots of random code examples, including some of my um, contributions to PyMC3, which I'm a core contributor to. And all the code examples I'm going to talk about are on my uh, on this bit.ly link, which I hope is still working. If it's not, I'll tweet out afterwards to to read the assignments. But there's lots of examples from different parts of my paper. And that's a standard disclaimer in case I get sued, right? So I used to work for Amazon in Luxembourg. I also worked for Vodafone. I also worked for startups, including one called Job Today, which is Job Marketplace. Um, I wrote a book because I had too much spare time. Um, <laughs> it's, it's actually quite cool. It's called Interviews with Data Scientists. It's a collection of interviews with various data scientists from around the world, um, from places like Spotify, Etsy, etc. Um, and asking them the, roughly the same questions about how they run into challenges in their work and stuff like this. And there's like people who work professionally in geosciences who are using pandas because they're they're dealing with the geo um, physical challenges and how they deal with that and the various data visualization tools. So it's very interesting how all these tools that we use with professionally are being used in various different areas. Like the, one of the most famous recent examples, which makes me excited as a physics graduate, was LIGO, the discovery of gravitational waves, used NumPy, Jupyter Notebooks, Pandas, and various other things in their actual code. I think there's actually some um, uh, Stan and Bayesian and stuff in there too, which is tremendously exciting. It makes you realize that even though you're not doing rocket science, you're still using the same tools as people doing rocket science. And um, all the proceeds of this go to Gnome Focus. For those of you who do not know what Gnome Focus is, it's the charity that supports um, high data events, they support diversity in tech, and they do lots of other you know, wonderful stuff. So this is my new adventure. Um, I joined them in uh, Channel 4. They actually were the first company ever to make me move from Luxembourg to London. Um, I lived in Luxembourg for roughly five years. Um, every year I told a London company, I'm not moving, I'm not moving, my girlfriend's here. And then they said, how much? And I said, a number. And then, and then, and then I, they, they matched that number, so I had to move. So, um, um, so this is what and the sort of stuff they're famous for. I'm not going to talk too much about my professional work. I am going to talk about work, the stuff tools I use in my professional work. So Python version 3 is out, please, everybody just use it. I don't care, I don't care that you're old, young, indifferent, I don't know, like you have a religious problem with this, you know, just please move all your code as soon as possible to 3, because um, 2.7 will be discontinued very soon, and you'll just look like an idiot. Or you'll make your future, like, re replacement, like your junior software engineer suffer. You can see it that way. Okay, so it's April 2016, and I want to do analytics and data. Depends what you want to do. This talk includes a sample code. Um, it's what new, what's not new. It's very influenced by a friend of mine, Rob Story, who's a data engineer over in Portland, uh, Oregon. Um, only I'm going to talk a little bit more about statistics and machine learning. I'm basically going to talk about the stuff I work on, you know, because I'm completely biased, and stuff like this. And there's no bikes in my talk. If you've seen uh, Rob Story's talk from Data Saddle, which is very, very good from last year, he uses bikes as metaphors for, for some of these tools. Which is actually kind of a nice way. He did complain, though, that you should never ever like tie yourself to something like that publicly. Because you do spend most of your time trying to come up with metaphors about bikes, rather than like actually writing at all. So, occasionally we're asked this question. Why would you use Python for analytics? Why not use Java or C or whatever? Um, and there's kind of a very simple reason, right? Python is not very fast for things like web servers. Go is probably the best in class at the moment. I don't know anything about web servers, though, so someone else can tell, talk about that. Um, but it's very fast for things like high-performance compu computing and numerics. And this is largely based on PhD theses, right? So this is, you know, like everything we use in Pandas or Numbi or something is someone's PhD thesis, you know, you know, from a few years ago when they were running into these problems. And it's because of C and Fortran underneath the hood, right? So if you look at, like, what you're actually using, like, in, in scikit-learn, like, you're actually, if you're using support vector machine in scikit-learn, you're actually using a Fortran written version, I believe, under the hood. And if you look at, like, your dependency graph, you'll see these sort of things. And these have been refined over many, many years because Fortran is one of the fastest languages out there for numerics. 
you can write things in Rust. And when I first wrote this publicly, one of my friends said, yeah, I'll do it. And within a week, he had caught, was calling Python from Rust, which is a, a language which is apparently C done right. That's his direct quote. And he's got it into production. So he can, he's calling Rust as a high performance computing language, which he's written all his, like, he's written his support vector machine code in, in Rust. Don't know why he does this stuff. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, it's his cup of tea, to be honest. Um, and, you know, and the Theano is the other kind of toolkit we're seeing. So PyMC3, which I'm a contributor to, uses Theano instead of four fan under the hood. You know, and it's been constantly developed by one of the major artificial intelligence research institutes in uh, Montreal. Mont Mont so, you know, this is a kind of, I thought I turned that off. Um, this is what is going to happen the whole time. Is this manageable? Because we kind of have to improvise right now, because I'm not coming back to do this again. <laughs> okay, we can see that. Right. We'll try this and hope for the best. That's my only solution. Like every time I write code and put it into production. Um, okay, so that's, these are the reasons why you use uh, Python for Analytics. Um, like everything I do in the open source community, I basically copy from everyone else and have no original ideas. So I depend on a lot of people smarter than myself, uh, including Rob Story in this case. So these are the strengths of PyData, right? So you have a rich and varied ecosystem. You've got lots of activities and um, lots of different ways of attacking the problems. The best part about this talk is that every time I give it, I'm out of date by the time I finish giving this talk because someone like Wes McKinney of Pandas fame has actually been doing new work that I have no idea how to keep up with. Um, and it's got a great history of attacking hard problems by community effort. And it is largely thanks, thanks to these sort of companies, right? So this is the kind of, the other thing is that open source software does not happen by, you know, by you know, free agents all in their spare time. Um, you know, I don't know who believes that myth, but you know, like you, the substantial investments by the likes of Cloudera, Container Analytics, Why Have, Inria, the Institute in Paris, which a lot of the scikit-learn work has done at, and Spotify, and uh, Why Have, you know, have contributed to various you know, data visualization libraries and data pipeline libraries. So, this is roughly, um, and this is out of date too, probably. Um, is roughly what you know the PyData stack and the PyData ecosystem is, right? So you have Jupyter, Pandas, Blaze, Psychic Learn, Stats Models, Spatsy, X-Array, SciP, Spider, Tables, Keras, etc., etc. I'm not going to talk about everything in depth because that would take hours and hours, um, and I would just bore you. But I am going to touch on as many of these as possible and tell you where you would use them what problems you would use these things to attack, um, what, you know, which of these are mature and which of these are not mature, because there's, there's various levels of maturity here. 
I'm also going to tell you which ones I think you should contribute to if you are if you do have spare time and you do wish to contribute to open uh, source software. Um, and and also I'm going to talk a little bit about um, like you know what the future of the stack will look like this ecosystem. So this ecosystem has dramatically changed in the past two to three years, generally because of the work by the previous companies I mentioned. You know, um, sometimes in pursuit of profit, sometimes for more noble ends, and and this is also going to be a lot different soon. You know, especially with the explosion of things like Spark, which is probably one of the most exciting technologies that we're dealing with right now. So, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and I'm also going to talk about when you use these tools. And the distinction I'm going to use is I'm going to use, um, because big data is kind of like passe, I'm going to talk about in memory, out of core, and distributed. I'm going to use that as your distinction. Because if your workstation is like an AWS uh, workstation with lots and lots of RAM, then you can theoretically fit a lot of things in memory. I think there's a new instance coming out that has two terabytes of RAM. I think on AWS, I don't think it's out yet. It's in it's in beta testing mode, but that you know, that's like my entire like web one of my web analytics tables of work that will fit in well. Like that's you know, no need to deal with Spark clusters, no need to pay for expensive data engineers, um, you know, all these sort of things. You can just do it in all in RAM, and we're going to see more and more of these tools as well. So this is kind of distinction that I'm trying to bring in. Um, it's not my ideas. I think Hadley Wickham was the, of our fame was the first one to publish these distinctions, but that's what I'm going to talk about. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about statistical tools. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the future. Okay. So very quickly, I'm going to talk about like the the things that I whenever I was excitedly writing this talk, probably at two o'clock in the morning because I'm lazy and procrastinate. Um, but you know, what is the new and useful tools in the PyData ecosystem? So, it's really difficult to talk about PyData without talking about NumPy and Pandas. So, we have a few improvements. Um, Matplotlib, the coloring has got better. There's been extensive work on that, which, you know, really makes everybody's, like, master's thesis look so much better. Um, Simpy, for those of you who do not know, Simpy is kind of a Mathematica clone. Um, it allows you to do symbolic mathematics. Probably not much interest to you if you're in an industry, but certainly interesting if you're in a mathematics department. Um, and there's been improvements in NumPy. Um, the new app operator in NumPy um, is very interesting. Uh, it allows you to simplify um, writing uh, linear algebra code. I'm going to have a quick example of this afterwards. And in Pandas, Pandas has got so complicated that one of the Pandas core developers is now writing a post to explain what's new in Pandas. But two of them I find very interesting were the assign operator, which you, I'll include one quick example in this talk, but it basically allows you to create a new column very easily. It copies. You have speed improvements, but and it's just really easy to to um, to not write badly because I'm not running into some of the performance bottlenecks in Pandas. You know, they wrote it as a way around that problem. And Pipe, and Pipe just allows you to write things in very much a functional way. And I'm a big believer in functional programming, largely because I grew up coding Haskell and reading these horrible books. And that's my ideology. Um, <laughs> but um, the, the Pipe operator in Pandas is very similar to the Pipe operator in R. Makes it really easy. To, you know, to, to, to apply functional design patterns to data problems, which is very useful and you know, makes your code a lot more pretty and, and elegant, easier to deal with. Okay, so you might not be able to see this because the resolution here is not very good. But basically all I've done here is I've randomly generated some data and in my third column I've added a log, a logarithm, a natural logarithm. Um, this makes it really easy if you're doing lots of financial analysis, you know, it's a standard question of apply logarithms or lots of other data problems. Um, you can also use it for things like percentages and all these sort of things. It, you know, beforehand it was a little bit more complicated to do these things and you had to do like little tricks and stuff. 
So, you know, it's just greatly improved my workflow of writing pandas, which often what I need to do is to write another column that's very, very similar, but is multiplied by some sort of factor. So have a play around with it yourself, and if you don't like it, uh, tell the pandas people off. I don't know. So, so right now we've done quite well, right? Um, and so that's like the kind of pandas thing. I'm not going to talk much about pandas for the rest of the talk, unfortunately. I'm going to talk about some of the other tools. Okay, so you have a data problem. So what is a data problem? Well, in practice, it's grouping and counting things. That's often what you need to do. You need to, you know, this is why SQL is such a powerful language for extracting data from databases. Because of these sort of like relational algebra constructs that are in there. And if you read things like tidy data by Hadley Wickham, he talks a lot about this as a design pattern for dealing with data. So, my data set is um, stolen from the UCI adult data set. I put a CSV version here on this URL. It's also in my, in my, um, on my GitHub for, for the stuff attached to this talk. The um, reason I picked that is it's a, it's a well-known data set. Um, has categorical variables, has text, you know, has numeric, has these sort of things. And you can easily do some like basic logistic regression on it, if, or, or various other things like that. Okay, let's say that you are locked in a room, and you can only use Pan, the Python 2.6. I don't know why this would happen, but I'm sure it's happened to someone. Um, and, um, and you want to count things, right? So the first thing you have to do is you can use the CSV library, which is in the standard library. You have to build your own conversion map, so you have to define your, your what your data structure is like. What is it an integer? Is it a float? Is it a string? Is it all these sort of things? So that's not too hard to do. You can load your CSV data source. Um, this is not fast at all, but this does work. And we're assuming that you're locked in the room and you have infinite time. Um, <laughs> so you know, like, so you can apply these kind of. Um, uh, you know, this mapper, you know, it's a really own type conversions. So, and then here, the last thing, you know, you've loaded your, you've used this list comprehension to load your, your data into, into your memory, in like a way that it's stored, and you can do some analysis on it. And then it looks like this. So you have like a kind of quasi JSON-like data structure here, right? You know, so you have all your, your variables, what they contain, etc., etc. And, Let's say you want to get your maximum age in this data set. And these are the kind of examples they're going to use for all the other tools, because this is a standard question. You want to find a maximum, you want to find a minimum, you want to find a mean, you want to find a median, whatever you want to do. These are the standard questions that we, we, we will deal with, you know, as professional data scientists, or aspiring professional data scientists. So you can do this, so you get your max age, and the max age is 90 in this data set. Or you can do it in this generator-like expression, which is a bit more Pythonic. And let's say you want to group things. Well, you can use the collections library. You can use default. Uh, dict. Default dict is awesome. Uh, so awesome, I forget about it every time and have to go look it up. <laughs> I forget to reuse it. Um, and this allows you to do a grouper. So you have your, your grouping operation, you know, a bit like group by in, uh, in SQL. And you apply this to your data set. And then you can get the mean number of hours by occupation. And you can see here, these are the answers. So uh, I forget which one was the highest. I think it's fishing. Farming and fishing has the highest mean number of hours working. And uh, this is 1950s. This is probably not representative of modern day life. Um, I think it's 1950s when this data set was put together. Okay, so previously you'll see like an example there that I use like a generator expression. This is just kind of like, this is written for me by the way, right? So I, I wrote this talk for myself, not for my Um But like intertools, if you're not using it, look it up. Um, there's a great tutorial by GM Duke. It greatly simplifies your workflow. <coughs> And people have thought long and hard about why these things are in the standard library. So, you want to count things, but you want to, to rate them in a functional way. Maybe one of your colleagues has been reading a Haskell book, 
and it's telling you that you know, have to write things in a functional way, you can use Pytools. So Pytools is awesome. It allows you to use functional programming techniques in Python. This is a link to the, to the document, to the documentation. And um, if you want to make Pytools faster, someone wrote Scitools, which is like you know a high performance version of Pytools, which is written in Scythe, I think. So, so here's like the first example. So you you want to do things like the frequencies of your ages in this data set. Um, you can also do something called currying. I don't even really know what that is. It just like graphically simplifies my workflow. Um, but you want to count by all of the occupations with greater than 15 years of, of education, right? So you, know, you want to see, like, if you have 15 years of education, you know, what occupations would you be in? And what count is there? And you can see, like, professional spe specialities, 3, 2, 1, which is the highest, I think, answer here, which is what you would expect logically. Um, and this here, this sort of pipe-like thing here, is actually now in the Pandas library which allows you to type together. So you can think of it kind of like plumbing, right? So you're applying one operation, you're letting the water flow through, you're, you're applying another operation. Um, and, you know, and that can greatly improve your workflow and make things a lot faster and easier to read and a lot easier to de debug. And I think the debuggability of um, data science uh, code is probably the, one of the harder problems. So. It has all these uh, virtues that people who write Haskell books go on about. But it's got composability, purity, and laziness. So things are only evaluated when needed. Um, it's all written in Python data structures, so there's no like dependencies underneath, right? So that's that's quite an interesting thing about it. It's not often talked about. Um, you don't see many talks about Pytools. Um, you know, when I came across it, it just greatly improved my workflow. And, you know, these sort of things, we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel, right? We should be using the work of others, you know, who've thought hard about these problems, to, you know, to, to, you know, to solve our challenges, which is, you know, something by last Tuesday, you know, which is in most of our work environments. Okay, so a quick interlude. Pandas, not going to talk too much about pandas in this talk. Um, it's the API has greatly become more stable. Like that's one of the more interesting things in recent uh, in recent releases. Um, there's a lot of talk among like the pandas, um, those who write it, like whether it is becoming more like NumPy and SciPy, like more core member of the stack, so that other tools are built on top of it. We're already seeing this happening. For those of you who use stats models and Seaborn, you'll notice that pandas is a core member, you know, it's a core dependency of those libraries. Um, and, you know, the, things like the indexing and, uh, and dealing with CSV files and, you know, some of the new data formats that are out there um, are becoming greatly more stable and greatly more uh, interesting. And so, I mean, it's, I, think, I think it's just a wonderful piece of software and something that we kind of underestimate how much work has gone into that. Okay, so a quick pandas example. So you group by education, uh, the edic, EDUC column, and you get your mean. So quite a simple, simple answer, easy for any analyst or any analytical person to think about. I'm not going to talk about NumPy either, but it's very difficult to not talk about it because all the other tools I'm going to talk about, like X-Array and DASP, and if you don't know what they are, you will go to the end of this talk. Um, are strongly influenced by it. Pandas depends on it. Many other projects like SciPy depend on it. There's a lot of interesting things like the ability to release the global interpreter lock. You'll see a lot of talks about this. Um, you know, you know, allow you to do more things like um, parallelism, multi-threading, you know, all these kind of speed and, you know, improvements that we have. Because the computers we have now, like this one, is a four core, um, and, you know, whereas, you know, originally when Python was designed, you know, about 20 or it is even 30 years ago, we only had like one CPU on the computer. So these sort of performance improvements and, you know, uh, hardware improvements have not been taken into account, but they, they do apply to the PyData ecosystem, largely because of all the C and 4 kind of stuff that I talked about earlier on. And um, 
the ad operator, which I popped up with uh, earlier. If you don't uh, just look it up, someone's written many articles about this, and it's just really nicely makes writing numpy, writing mathematics in numpy easier, particularly for novices. So for those of you who teach, this is a great thing to you know, allow people to use this quicker, as opposed to something horrible like math. So it's the end range of it. So, X-ray. Right, so, X-ray is for labeled heterogeneous data. I don't know what that means either, right? But this is the way I think about it. You have, rather than just one index, you have multiple indexes, you know? So rather than just having time, like in pandas, which worked really good for tabular data, you have time and temperature. Now, most of us don't run into this problem, but if you are dealing with weather data, and I've got a number of friends who are meteorologists, this is a common thing you run into. You run into time and various other vectors. Um, if, if your weather forecasting data is stored in something next CDF, you'd use this, and this is what the author did this for. He, he worked with weather forecasting data in a lab. Um, I'm just bringing it up as a possible tool for you to, to, to be aware of. You don't have to use it. I can't force you to do anything. Um, but X-ray looks like this, right? So you take a numpy array, and you add a second index. So it's your second index is your coordinates, A, B, and C. Your dimension one coordinates are foo, bar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you build up your X, uh, X. Sorry, originally it was called X-ray, then they renamed it. But you build up your X-ray array data array, and you'll see here you have your multi-index. So your X index is your dimension zero coordinates and your y index is your dimension one coordinates so you can do things like you can do the pandas like things of going by location like by going by that index you'll pick off that data to slice it which is really useful for this multi-dimensional data that you're dealing with you'll often want to look at time slice by time slice for example or temperature slice by temperature slice if you're dealing with weather data um, there's plenty of other examples in the notebooks. Here's a few last examples. So you can look at things like 0 to 3. Mm -hmm. You can look at just your dimensions. You can look at just your coordinates. You can calculate means, right? So you can calculate means along this dimension. So your, your mean average temperature along the y coordinate, something like that. So, so, so far, everything I've talked about has been in memory, right? So far, everything I've talked about has been limited by my, you know, my computation engine. So why can't I do pandas-like things in Postgres? Now, you might ask, why would I want to do pandas things like in Postgres? Postgres is a beautiful piece of software. It's like 25 years old. It's one of the most heavily committed to uh, projects out there. It's, it backs so much like money that has been made by major companies. You know, the number of... Uh, major startups that are like, I think Instagram originally was in Postgres at the back end. Um, you know, so, and, and it has a huge amount of power for computation because it's been refined over many years and there's various speed improvements and it works really well for, with certain architectures and stuff like this. So you might have some data in CSV file, some data in HD F5, you know, which is generally like what you get like scientific data in. Um, like or you can have some data in our SQL database. You still run into in-memory problems. So you're, you're, you're running out of memory. You're actually running out of memory. Right, so the right answer to this problem is not go and buy Spark. Like, go to give Cloudera lots and lots of money. Right, that is not the right answer to this problem. There are in-between ways. You have bigger than I can RAM data. Right? So you're now you're into the kind of out of core problem, right? Now you're into like stuff will not fit in memory anymore. You could use a bigger computer, but we'll, we'll not do that just yet. Getting a bigger machine is overkill. Uh, and the other question is a more fundamental philosophical question that like Wes McKinney and various others have been talking about for a long time. You know, like you know, why are my analytical expressions, that is like me thinking about a mean, right? Because that's what you're thinking about. But when you're trying to solve a data science problem, you're often trying to find a mean or a logistic regression or something like this. 
Now, what, can I have expressions that work across your data structures and storage? And the answer is Blaze is one answer for this problem. And Blaze is predominantly done by the Continuum Analytics people. So, Blaze is not just a thing, unfortunately. This talk would be really easy if things were just a thing. It's multiple things. Um, and this is why my head hurts, just like even doing this, you know, looking these things up. So you have Blaze, which is an interface to query data on different storage systems, like Postgres, for example. You have Dask, which is parallel computing through task scheduling and task algorithms. I don't know what that means either. It just means that it's really cool and does things really fast and allows me to not worry about parallelism. Um, you've got Datashape, which is a data description language. I, I've not used it too much, but it, I have tested it. It's pretty useful. You have D, a C++ library for dynamic multi-dimensional arrays. And you have Odo. And Odo is great for data migration between different storage systems. By the time I finish this talk, they'll probably add another thing to this, but just the point is that this ecosystem is growing and you know we should probably call it or something with an axe. Um, or at least it'll make it easier for me. Um, we'll talk about Dask later. We'll use Odo and Blaze in this demo. Data Shape and DynD are awesome, but I don't have time to talk about them. Okay. So you import Blaze as BZ, you you create this this thing like which is a symbol right so at this point you've not done anything you've just defined a symbol that you can think about right so you're not you're not you know you're not applying any like analytical uh, operations yet you know no you know it's basically this is lazily evaluated so you you create your thing like your your two computations mean age and hours count so two standard cap copper you know things that you will want to think. You're, you're counting the number of hours in group by operation, and the other one is you're, you're finding your mean age. Standard questions in any data project, as I'm sure we all know. Okay, but you haven't computed anything yet. You only compute things when you do bz.compute, and you apply this to your, to your adult data set. And currently, I'm letting pandas compute this, and I'm doing this all in memory. So, so here you have like the number of um, years of education by a certain filter of great, well, 35 hour, hours of work per week. Okay, so we did all that. We did all that in Pandas. Let's compute this in Postgres. The hardest part of doing this demo was setting up Postgres uh, and setting up the table and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's amazing how you forget these things. Um, so we're going to use Postgres as our computation engine. So we create this result, um, which is a SQL selector. So we create this here. So we're not doing anything yet. We're just creating it, holding it there in our code. Then we're going to do this compute by this Postgres data source. And then we're going to apply Odo to map the results from Postgres, you know, so Postgres is doing all the hard work and then the outputs in a pandas data frame. So my data could be huge, my data could be two terabytes and I could do all this. And I have not changed how I've thought about the problem. So I could, I could prototype on 10% of the data, see if it works realistically according to some of my business logic or my domain specific knowledge and then ship it off without changing any code really other than say the back end of specifying Postgres. The good news is it works with Spark too, guys. So you could have a Spark cluster in the background. I've used this myself. You know, testing on 10% of the data, having a Spark cluster set up, and just applying the same rules because my logistic regression or my computation will be the same you know, on, a, on my big data versus on my small data. And you can also do things like store B calls. Um, we'll see B calls and C table, the storage format later, but these are some of the more exciting, particularly for me, compression uh, like data containers that are out there. Um, uh, if you don't know what this is, it's probably because it's not well advertised and they don't have a cool logo. But 
you know, this is the kind of thing you can do, right? So you can move things from pandas to vcalls, move things from pandas to Spark, move things from pandas to any SQL data. Database. And this has all kind of been solved. I think the last time I looked at uh, Odo, it was covering pretty much every major data format that I could think of off the top of my head. So maybe you will find an obscure one and because so many pull requests. So you can use any SQL supported by SQL Alchemy as your computation. Also supports Python lists, Spark data frames, MongoDB if you take your life. Our NumPy arrays. <laughs> okay, so I want to, I've talked about being calls already. I want to maximize my speed of reading and writing on a single computer. So B calls is a columnar data store for fast data storage and retrieval with built-in high performance compression. Supports both in-memory and out-of-memory storage and operations. Um, so there's there's, it's very useful for things like time series. This is one of the things I've used it for in the past. Time series data, you often just have to add to it. You often have to read really fast because the opposition is going to read it faster than you will. Um, and these sort of things. Um, it has some great synergies with binary formats like HDF5. Um, so this example here, I think, what did I do? Okay, so originally I had three gigabytes of data. I pulled it into this B calls data um, storage C table, and then I was left with 575 megabytes. So I've done nothing else other than just apply this operator. So that's about a factor of six, I think, or five um, of, of, of compression. There's another example I do later on that you get seven times compression. And you can do standard things like, you know, you can look at like how the data structures are stored, how it finds all this compression for you. Basically, a lot of data that we deal with, you have a lot of uh, repetition, you know, and the standard compression algorithms work quite well. So, oh, this is my, this was my benchmark, right? So, you generate one gigabyte of data, you input B calls, you, it takes about 60 seconds to do this, and my compression ratio was 7.54. Though nothing else other than use a library that's off the shelf here. Um, you know, for, so for just for sheer speed of reading and writing, you know, reading you know, a small data set is a lot quicker than reading a large data set. So there's tremendous performance uh, improvements that you can get from that. It has fast numerical calculations. Um, it's got intelligent use of caching and multi-threading to optimize numerical calculations, and nobody's using it, and that's why I'm talking about it. So, please, someone use it. Like, give them a reason to to be talked about, you know, and cool, and all these sort of things, you know, you know, or become their spokesperson. I don't know. Um, so, so let's look at the adult data set again. Um, these are just a few benchmarks to put into context. With B calls, you can do pandas like things. It uses uh, chunking. Um, it makes it ideal for s s storing and retrieving market data. So you can do this like the standard pandas like thing of like, or, or, or even like SQL like of filtering, looking for work class being equal to state government. You can do like, um, you can get your sort of your answers out here. Um, the, the release candidate for version one is out. There's some challenges with integration with the rest of the PyData ecosystem. So this is a less mature project than some of the other projects I talked about. But this should stabilize. And I was looking for a case study of someone who's using it, Contopian. Um, my friend Thomas Vecchi, who's a co- uh, We work together in PyMC3. Um, he works for these guys. They're a crowdsourced hedge fund. You can do algo trading on their platform. You can lose money. Gain money, I don't know what you want to do. Um, I believe use B calls because they have the challenge of lots and lots of time series data, right? You know, their their business model is, you know, their, their value proposition is based on time series data. Um, and time series data is always getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Because time's always going forward because it only goes in one direction. Because of some physics stuff. Um, <laughs> And they discovered that it um, allowed you to escape the global interpreter lock. 
you had better compression for binary data, and they wrote up like a case study of why they used this. So, my data is bigger than RAM or in a cluster. I can use DAST or specifically DAST.array. Um, uh, so DAST looks at this, right? So you can create a DAST array from, uh, I've built an array in this code. Um, and you can do chunks, so you, you pull things into memory when you need it. Like, you don't need, you know, you don't need to be dealing with a Spark cluster to do this. You can just deal with intelligent algorithms. Um, you can multiply this array by a factor, and you can find the minimum value. For those of you who love pandas, you will feel that this looks exactly like pandas. It's very similar to the pandas API. You don't need to learn new stuff. You can just rely on the shoulders of giants or something. So, so the data set I used was the point of interest data set for this here little demo. The point of interest data set is like stuff like bars, churches, etc. throughout the world. It's predominantly North American focused, like all these data sets, because you know America runs the world. Um, but you know. Here I've extracted all the schools, and um, I did that because of the extraction of pubs, and it was too obvious as a joke. Um, you know, and you know, I found all these amenities. And here it's very much the same as the Blaze example. The first line here with school has not done anything. Nothing is computed is computed yet. The second is only whenever I call dd.compute that I compute something. So we have about 342k um, schools in the UK and Ireland, an open street map project. And so I've done my computation in Dask. I'm going to plot in Matplotlib. Um, it's very similar to the pandas and numpy API. I do a little scatter graph. And this is the kind of thing you got. So this here data set, I think, on the computer I was testing this on was bigger than my RAM. I think I had two gigabytes of RAM on it and the data set was three gigabytes. I was able to use it without any huge issues. It worked out of the box. It's, it's not a very mature project according to the authors, but it was mature enough for this use case. So if you're ever running into the problem of like a slightly larger than RAM data set, don't get your money to Kydera. You know, you don't have to. Unless it's not your money and you can do whatever you want. Um, okay, so when do you use Dask, right? So medium data, right? So medium data is greater than RAM size. Generally, Dask comes into its own at around 16 gigabyte data sets. Anything around the one terabyte, the one petabyte range probably needs either a good SQL database or something like Spark. And my own laptop, it has eight gigabytes of RAM, but I borrowed a friend for some of these benchmarks as well. And I worked on his as well. So, let's say you want to do distributed arrays in, in the PyData ecosystem. Well, there's a very easy way to research this. You just tweet, does anyone know any distributed arrays? And the authors come back to you and tell you about their project. <laughs> this, is, this is one way to get information. Um, there's both which is distributed arrays back by Spark. I've only tested it once. Um, I'm not smart enough to do DevOps. Um, it's dist array, which is from Nthought, I think, which is other distributed arrays. Biggest, which is another kind of distributed arrays from the Met Office in the UK. Um, it's, it's virtual, it does like lazy evaluation. And Dask.array, which is distributed arrays using task schedule. They've also recently got this working with um, Hadoop and Spark. Uh, so it does work entirely distributed. There's a few teething problems out there, but it's very interesting. And I think at Pi Data London, Travis Aldefant of Continuum is going to make a big song and dance about it because that's what he's supposed to do. Right, Spark, yay. Um, um, this is the bane of my existence. Um, who, who here can deal with Java stack trace errors? Like, I'm made it. Like, I don't understand this stuff at all. Like, you know, Pi 4J, what, what is this crap? You may as well be talking to me in Swahili. Um, so, so it's a very exciting uh, technology for the JVM community. Um, because finally we can do math. 
Um, it's improvements in them. It's got improvements in Pi Spark and interoperability. There's been uh, ML loops improved dramatically. It comes into its own with lots of JSON, like blah blah data. Um, and there's been dramatic speed improvements for the easy to distribute problems. I think we're now at Spark 1.60, right? And I think 2.0 is coming out next year. Or very, maybe even the end of this year. So, interlude. I'm not going to talk much about Spark because I don't like it. Um, but um, I do use it, but I, I, also, I also use Windows every so often. Um, so, <laughs> so, I want to speed up, speed up my code, right? So what will you do? Well, there's numerous ways to attack this problem. There's Numba. Numba is a fast LLVM based just in time compiler that's easy to use via decorators, so easy to use even I can write it. The Siphon, which is an unusual language actually. Siphon is actually a blend of C and Python. So you have like C types in it. You do have the speed improvements. Um, you know, it's great speed up. PyPy, PyPy is another compiler. Um, so it's not the standard uh, Python compiler. Um, it's got, it doesn't have support for NumPy code the last time I checked. I was told they are improving it. For basic like Python code, if you're not using any like vectorization, it does give you dramatic speed improvements. You know, just kind of out of the box. There's plenty of tutorials online. There's new tools arriving. One of my friend Ian Oswald wrote a book about this called High Performance Python, which is really good. And you should check it out. And he paid him to say that. Um, and that's the end of that interview. Okay. Okay, so these are kind of the recent improvements in dealing with big data. This is kind of like when I talk about the future. One thing I've learned about predicting the future is uh, it's really hard. But I'm going to try anyway. Um, distributed computing has been improved dramatically in the task. And if you look at Matt Rocklin, who's the core architect of this project, um, and looks like a cross between a poet and like a, a professor of mathematics or something. I don't quite understand that mix. But um, PyData um, is just getting better at dealing with big data. Um, soon you may not need to use a JVM to bypass the JVM for these projects to deal with uh, HDFS, not to be confused with HDF5. Um, Spark is approving um, too. Um, other people can talk about that. I know you've had talks about this. Arrow and Ibis, right? So this is something I'm actually, actually excited about. So the Arrow project is um, an Apache project, which is where all good projects go to die. And um, <laughs> it is, um, it's, a, it's actually a software standard. So it's a column or a data standard, you know, for, for storing data. You know, so, Avoiding the speed challenges of CSV files, right? So you shouldn't really be storing things in CSV files. CSV files were not designed for data storage and retrieval and stuff like this. I do use them all the time, by the way. Um, but you know, they're they're trying to attack this problem in a theoretical way and you know, in a good software engineering way. There's Ibis, which is also Wes McKinney's project at Cloudera. That's what happened when they bought him, um, <laughs> and it's. Promising to have like out of the box um, the ability for you to think just of a problem like with a pandas API and not worry about all your distributed computing in the back end. And so it works currently with Impala, it works currently with Kudu, which is another project from Cloudera, and it also works with SQLite. The demo I give afterwards is with SQLite. Um, and if you look at like the links, if you Google Wes McKinney and the Arrow project, he explains Arrow and how it fits into the Pandas ecosystem. The, the one interesting thing is basically that currently, um, <coughs> without Arrow, you have to copy from Parquet or Impala or Kudu, dump it into another data format and then read it in Pandas, right? So you, that's just slow and bad and you know, should be fixed, and that's why someone's working on it. So this is um, a Pokemon example, because it's my talk, I can talk about whatever I want, and like, I like Pokemon, and um, big surprise for everyone in the audience. Um, so here I've taken a SQLite da database in the background, and um, this is like a Pokemon database. I've um, you know, loaded this into 
you know, this round object. Um, and now I am doing value counts. So I'm interacting with a SQL-like database without writing SQL, writing in pandas, and this could be in Pala, right? This could be a distributed database in the back end. So I don't need the context switch of going from Python to SQL to R, you know, that's like my day. Um, you know, theoretically, you know, and you know, this project is working. If this code works, you know, people are using it. It will get better pull requests. It's quite interesting, I think, and exciting. Okay. So when I was writing this talk, I was talking to Andreas Lohr of Scikit-learn, and he said, why doesn't someone do a map of the stack? And I said, why would anyone draw a flowchart of, of the PyData the stack? And I said, right, you do it. So um, that's how I get talked into doing things. It's on my blog. Um, you can't see it very well here, but it's an entire like, flowchart of like what size of problem you're getting. Is it medium data? Is it big data? What you should use? Am I dealing with time series? Am I dealing with um, arrays? And do my arrays have like different types in them? And I, I've printed this out at work and put it up. Like and it's really useful, just especially for me because I don't know anything. Um, and um, and of course when I showed this to people, they disagreed with it, and that's what always happens in open source community. Um, and you know, this is all extinct thread. Um, so I want to do stats on machine learning, right? Because you know, all that adding and counting is like a currency. But there's lots of cool stuff in Pi data land. There's Pi MC3, big surprise, I'm gonna bring this one up. Um, so there's been recent improvements in the documentation. Um, it's written on top of the ammo. We've got time series examples and the Bayesian logistic regression example, which I think I wrote. There's model evaluation functions, which are very similar to what you have in Scikit-learn of how you evaluate the model performance. Public service announcement is now in beta. Please break it. Send pull requests. I won't answer them because I don't have infinite time. But some will. Um, so, so, yeah. so this is based on logistic regression, right? And I'm going to give an entire tutorial about this um, at Pi Data London, which my, my employer is sponsoring. Um, so I, I did that all on my free will, um, but <laughs> so, but you know, so here I've ex, you know I've extracted a few features, I built them up. It's all online. You can even read in your own spare time. I've written in a Patsy in using Patsy like the, the for the formula like so m much like an R formula, you know, income is proportional to age plus age squared, etc., etc. You know, you're running that model, and then you just run a simple function to run this model and you know, get your answers out. So it's very easy to use. If you don't know how to use it, please watch my talk, which will be filmed, and I hopefully will teach you that. Stats models, right? So if you want to help PyData a lot, and we all want to help PyData a lot because we make money out of it, um, work on stats models. It's like it's the most embarrassing thing in the ecosystem. It's just like there's pull requests there that are older than I am. Um, that's a joke. Um, but you know, like there's like there's there's a huge improvement that can be made there. And often the view is that if you want to do frequent statistics, you should use R or Julia or one of these other tools. Scikit-learn. So Scikit-learn. Um, I haven't changed this last part from Heidi in Amsterdam. Um, you can't chat to Andreas, he's not here, here. Um, but tweet to him, he always answers you eventually. Um, it's the best documentation in PyData actually, that's one thing worth celebrating. Like, it's like an entire machine learning book in the documentation, it's all there for free. It's got lots of cool improvements recently. The ones worth talking about are in relation to hyperparameter search, so like you got your hyperparameters. There's various ways of getting through there. There's, there's various algorithms that like shorten that path um, and improve your model performance. Um, and there's other other good things like um, they've they've renamed the API stuff a bit more, and there's been speed improvements. I think some of the random one of the random forest algorithms has got significantly faster. But you can read the release notes. It'll say it all there. Okay, 
Let's say you want to analyze text, right? And let's say you don't want to be playing with NLTK because it's slow and crap, right? Let's say you want to do something in production, something to make money out of, right? There's two in the PyKDK system, production-ready, natural language processing toolkits, right? They're there, they're for free, they have MIT licenses or something like that. There's Spassy, which is very, very good for um, things like, um, it's got sense to vec in there, it's got a few new like word to vec like uh, things in it. It's got really good stemming and stuff, and the documentation is improving dramatically, and it's really, really fast. And there's Jensen, which is by Redeem, uh, Rehiric. Like you never pronounce his name, but we, we bond over our, our ethnically friendly names. Um, but it has really good word to back. It's got one of the you know, it's got one of the fastest word to back algorithms out there. It's got um, the documentation's not as good as I would like it to be, but the speed he's worked more on the speed improvements of the API rather than explaining how the API works. It works well with lots of different machine learning data sets and data formats like um, you know, there's these very sparse matrices, uh, data stories, things like there that's are typical of machine learning circles. These are two, right? I can't think of another language out there that has two world-class, production-ready, uh, open-source libraries that you don't have to pay for anyone or like, you know, it's, it's, it's an abundance of riches. And I know there's a bunch of natural language processing people in this audience. So I hope this is exciting for you. So, the future, what's coming next? Apache Arrow, um, there's been substantially improved, they're promising things like this, right? So substantially improved data access speeds, closer to native performance, Python extensions with things like Apache Spark, new in-memory analytics functionality for nest and JSON like data. And when I wrote this talk originally, it wasn't out, right, but they released something called Feather, which with McKinney and Hadley Wickham have worked together on it. You know, this is just showing off now. Um, and I've both are, are looking at the problem of data frames from R to Python, right? So they're, they've created an entirely new data format for the back end, which is some sort of binary format, very similar to Parquet. I think it might be based on Parquet. The speed improvements when I played around with it were substantial. I think they were about seven or eight times compared to reading from CSV. So these sort of things are being worked on, you know, like, and in a way that is, you know, is, it's a bit overwhelming in a good way because, you know, abundance of choice. But I hopefully the point of this talk was to give you a guide of where these things are going and what you can use them for. And this stuff just makes my head explode. Um, so there's computational toolkits, right? Um, most of these are to do with deep learning. Some of these are based on top of each other. TensorFlow has actually got better in the past couple of weeks. TensorFlow has now got distributed stuff like out of the box. Um, Theano's improving dramatically. Keras 1.0 was out, I think, last week. They dramatically rewrote the API, a lot easier to use. Kafi, I don't know not, not too much about. Um, and there's Dato, which is a different competition tool because I don't have time to go into. Of course, this is kind of like the agenda that I have whenever I give a talk at an open source friendly uh, conference or something similar. Is that software that does not be, is not developed in isolation, it needs money, and this is where supporting organizations like Non-Focus or donating time from your company if you're in such a situation can help a lot. And fundamentally, like all these things, they are community effort. So the future of the stack is up to you. So thank you very much for listening to me ramble for however long I ramble for. You've been a good audience. Thank you.